another bucket story. Follow me here. The budget. What happens to the state's bucket full of money next year and will residents see any Tabor refunds or will the state keep the extra cash? And joining us to talk about the bucket, I heard you guys laugh, it's okay. <laughs> uh, we have members of the Joint Budget Committee, the Chairwoman of the Committee, State Representative Millie Hamner and State Senator Kevin Grantham. Thanks both for joining mm -hmm. us to talk about what you've been working on for months. Thanks, thanks Thank for being you. interested. No, no, right. Hey, we have to be. It's the, it's the one thing lawmakers are required to do in Colorado. So. Let's start with the, the fact that three Democrats, three Republicans, both in the House and the Senate, can come together for an agreement. So, Chairwoman, how difficult is it to have both sides agree on something that's, what, $27 billion? Well, the hardest part is hurting the other five members, you know, as I try to chair the meeting. <laughs> but, you know, as I mentioned this morning uh, or this week with uh, my colleagues, on the budget committee, it's almost as if you're not a Republican, you're not a Democrat, you're not a House member, you're not a senator, you're just a, a budget committee member, one of six people trying to figure it out and make it work. So you guys figured out a way to not decrease K-12, through but in fact increase it per student by, I think it was $112 per student, not have any college cuts, which goes against what we heard from the governor at the state of the state, sure. and still fund roads. I think CDOT gets $150 million. They could have got $200 million, so you either say they got 150 or they lost 50 that they were expecting. Or they could have got 100 True. So how do you, like, that, those are key things that, that people at home really care about, and how contentious were those debates to figure out how to make that work? Contentious, I, I wouldn't say much has been contentious amongst the six of us. Certainly uh, there's a lot of contention that goes on across the street over in the Capitol building, but, uh, you know, we, we view the problems as just that, problems that need to be solved, and so the six of us actually put our heads together pretty well and come to some agreement on where we need to go because the bottom line is, at the end of the day, you already mentioned it, we have to come up with a balanced budget. And so we actually work pretty well together, mm -hmm. and it... Uh, the end of the day, it came together. Let each of you, what was the toughest compromise to make? Uh, well, you know, this, this week has been difficult because the debate happens on the floor, and now the whole budget process is open to all 65 representatives, right? So it goes beyond just the understandings that the six budget committee members have. So there was a lot of contentious debate on the floor. Um, I think one of the hardest things for me was having to reduce the... Um, some services to our hospitals in order to make the budget balance. It gets a little complex, uh, but we did hear from some of our rural hospitals saying, um, you know, expressing the impact that that was going to have on them. I also wish we could have done more for K-12. I wish we could have done more for higher education. I'm so worried that uh, college tuition and student loan debt is going to continue to be a problem. It, we'll get back to that hospital thing, deals with the hospital provider fee, and we'll get back to that in a moment. Mm -hmm. Toughest compromise from, from, your, from the Republican standpoint. You know, that may still be to come. We have uh, one of the issues that's still hanging out there um, that we'll be dealing with when we get back over to the JBC and conference committee in about a week and a half. Uh, it has to do with the Department of Public Health and Environment and the Clean Power Plan. And putting back in 95, 96 employees back into the department, but also how are we going to deal with spending that goes with the clean power plan on, from the federal level. And so we still have that hanging out there, but Chairman Hamner is, is, was correct on all those points. All those were difficult things because a lot of these things affect our districts directly. Mm -hmm. um, we both have rural districts, and so uh, many of the things that we had to <laughs> grit our teeth and bear are things that really affect us directly in our in our areas. So you guys have been working months on this mm -hmm. and then as you said uh, chairwoman that the 65 representatives had their chance last week to start picking apart and and I, I we have video of that budget debate and and you you could fight me on this but it, it's boring <laughs> and oh, come I, on. I, the very first frame of video I, that I remember uh, seeing is the, look, State Representative Steve Lovesock oh. just wiping his eyes. But how difficult is it? You guys have been working on this for months, and now over the course of a day, you hear, I think there were 37 different amendments, meaning 37 different things that these lawmakers wanted to change to what you guys had presented them. How difficult is it to hear those ideas where you're like, whoa, 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 whoa. You think it's that easy that you can do this in a day? Now, he makes 37 amendments sound like a lot. Mm -hmm. When uh, in past years, I don't know, I think it's been at least twice that. How many do you anticipate in the Senate? Uh, maybe not quite as many as we <laughs> usually have, just like the House didn't have as many as we usually have. I mean, it can be 50, 60, 70 amendments in one House or the other. And so 
Yesterday was kind of a slow day for the long bill. Well, I told my colleagues there was really only one amendment necessary, and uh, <laughs> but they didn't. You know, I guess the way I see it, and um, you know, the tape of us looking pretty exhausted by the end of the day. I mean, we start early in the morning. The day ended at 9 p.m. So it's a long day, but what's exciting about it to me, and I think to all of the members who get the chance to debate the bill, is that even though we've been working on it since November, this is really their first week to to really dive in and to look at you know what we've done to critique it and put their own stamp on it, and I think that's a really important part of the process. I want to go back to the hospital provider fee. We have this little crude graphic that kind of describes, in the most basic of sense, what the problem with the hospital provider fee or not problem is. Uh, basically, as this graphic shows, you've got uh, uh, taxes, fees that equal the general fund and money that comes into the general fund. And then that, when you include the hospital provider fee, it's going to push everything up over the TABOR limit, meaning if that happens, we would get TABOR refunds. And this year, we're getting anywhere between 13 and $41 in a TABOR refund. But I know in next year, it's not projected for any TABOR refunds. But if you take that hospital provider fee at the bottom away and make it its own bucket, I'll, I'll stay with the bucket scenario, everything drops back down. And you guys figured out how much that was impacting. And so instead of taking the hospital provider fee out of the equation, you just said, let's reduce how much is allowed of the hospital provider fee. So you figured out 73 million, that puts us over the edge. And so you've taken that out. Is that the end of the hospital provider fee debate? You've, you've done the math and figured it out? <laughs> Not the end of the debate by far. And uh, of course, we've got a bill running in the House right now mm -hmm. uh, to still change that. So the debate goes on uh, from both sides, uh, whether or not we don't need it right now, but the debate will be um, whether we still need it in the future or whether we should have it at all now or in the future. Was this a way of Republicans saying this is our compromise? We're not going to do the enterprise thing, but we'll, we'll fudge the math with the hospitals to make it work. Well, the characterization fudge the math probably isn't something I think any of us would accept because uh, what we did was, I think, perfectly legal and constitutional in how we did it. And uh, it may be tough for some of our hospitals, uh, may be tough for some of our schools in some areas, and we didn't get as much in transportation in. Um, but what we did was legal and acceptable for all of us, and the hospital provider fee will be one of those debates that we'll still have as far as the constitutionality and sure. et cetera. I hear the sky may be falling still for future years, and that's why the hospital provider fee is still a debate. Why rents are sky high? Everything's, everyone's saying, come move to Denver. Why, why is this a problem? Why is our budget going to be in such flux in future years? Well, that's why I so appreciate this show and the opportunity to talk about this, because I think most Coloradans would be very confused about that. Um, but I think your graph, your bar graph, did a really nice job of showing if we lower the revenue coming in, we have less to refund. And so that's a temporary fix for this year. And we have just now moved the problem to the following budget year. So um, my hope is that that hospital provider fee conversation continues so that we can get a fix in place now so that we come back together and start developing the 17-18 budget. Uh, we have a better starting place. So that's why I'm hopeful. Well, because it hasn't been fixed, it gives us a reason to have you guys back when we have another segment that we can just talk about the hospital provider fee. Thank you both for coming in to You're talk welcome. about the budget, which uh, should be passed maybe later this month still before Hope the so. end of the set. <laughs> Usually it's one of the last things, but maybe in April. State Representative Millie Hamner, State Senator Kevin Grant. Thank, thank you. And we'll be right back.